you know, not just self-driving cars doing this, but you know, flying quadricopters that do like postal deliveries and stuff, all kinds of things, um, which make possible by the fact that you don't need to be a human or a company to get a effectively a bank account anymore. And so that's you know, and there's loads of stuff. So I really want to believe uh, in the future of Bitcoin. Um, the realist in me says that it's you know, it's very likely we could fall into some kind of niche if we are not strategic about this. But uh, you know, the optimist in me says that one day we will all get to the moon. Thank you very much. Should we, should we take some audience questions, maybe, if there are any? I guess a lot of people want to go to the bathroom, actually. Well, I have a question about, you say we, and I have a question about, you say we, if we are strategic, how many people, if, the, if you talk about the core Bitcoin uh, code, how many people can touch it? How many people really write on it? On the, on the very core code? Yeah, the very core code. I know. There's probably like 10 or 15 regular people that yeah. contribute, maybe. And, and how do they decide? Uh, how, do they deci how do they work together? And how do they decide what's going to be the next version? We decide through massive fights, and we work together very badly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, there is kind of a process, right? We debate vigorously, and then, um, for example, if there's, if there's a decision that needs to be made, then Gavin will make it. If you've never heard of Gavin before and you were thinking, oh, there's no one in charge of Bitcoin, it's all decentralized, yeah, I have a wake-up call for you. <laughs> there is actually someone who makes decisions. Okay. Uh, sorry? Just a second. I am blissfully unemployed right now. <laughs> I don't earn any money at the moment. No, I'm, I'm working on setting up a company, so I'm going to talk about that on Saturday as well. And you... you, you um... A good friend of mine left Switzerland to go work for Ripple, actually. Can you we used to work the question? Uh, sorry, the question was what about platforms like Ripple? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've never met anyone who actually uses Ripple in any kind of daily function, but they seem to be doing okay. And they seem to make money. So I don't know. I actually, uh, when I first found Bitcoin, I thought it was not revolutionary enough, and I thought Ripple was the way to go. Uh, I should say, this is Ripple before it got bought and renamed by a US company. This was back when it was a Canadian thing by some guy. Um, but yeah, I thought Ripple was more revolutionary and, and you know, would have better impact on society, but uh, I guess I was wrong about that. Now, if we go, um, you have this beautiful uh, system with the general ledger, the, and, and, and now we have 100,000 or between 15 and 100,000 transactions. If that becomes a million or 10 million, how big will that file on my computer become and how sustainable is that? Yeah, well, that's a big pile of work that we got coming up <laughs> in the next couple of years. So the idea, the answer is the file will be as big as you want it to be, and uh, your computer will throw away any data that can't fit, and you will be, um, you will still check the whole file to build the database and keep it up to date. But after it's been checked, you can throw away some of the old data, um, as long as you don't care about serving it to other nodes. So there's. We're, uh, the current software will use as many resources as it has to use, and what we need to do is effectively rewrite big chunks of it so that you can tell it what resources it's got to play with, and then it, it fits as much beneficial work as it can within those limits. And Patience? will it go in a de more decentralized way? If you go to an, a billion, uh, a, a billion of billion transaction, will it have to fundamentally <laughs> change? A billion those? transactions. Yeah. So that's every seventh person on the planet making a transaction every day. No, no, by a year, you know, a billion. If a billion you really transactions go, if a year. If you really scale, right. can, can the 15 programmers, the way you work together and the way you're compensated, uh, how will that, how yeah, will that system no. evolve? So, so to, grow, to grow transaction traffic you know, by an order of magnitude, you always have to change lots of things. This is something I saw at Google a lot, right? You write a piece of software, and then you, you increase the number of users by 10x, and you have to rewrite it again from scratch. So scaling is going to be huge work, <laughs> assuming it's successful. Right at the moment, we don't have a scaling problem because Bitcoin is not really growing. But uh, if that gets fixed, then you know that's going to be a ton of work. That's like the next 10 years of work. Vincent, have another question out the zaal. Hi, my name is uh, Carter Doherty with Bloomberg. There are a lot of examples out there of open source software governance. Like a, a good example would be Apache, the software running web servers, where the industry got together and said, for the sake of adoption. We're going to give away a lot of intellectual property. We're actually going to pay people to work on the code and get it up and running. And as I recall, that's been a resounding success. Is that a model for Bitcoin? Are you talking about ways you can make it sustainable, the development that is? Yeah, uh, 
I think we're going to, you know, experiment and pursue all kinds of different routes. Um, the danger with having some, you know, big, rich organization that just pays for everything is you, you end up stuck in that problem I mentioned where people's incomes are not connected to the success of the product they're working on. Um, I would like us to find a funding model where the success of the developers financially is directly connected to the success of the product, so they're not being cross-subsidized. But we'll see. You know, I guess there's going to be a lot of everything. Last question. Is there a reason why you are not yet arrested? Is there a reason why? Because I'm a nice person. That's why I'm not arrested. Yeah. Is there <laughs> I wouldn't a hurt a fly. <laughs> the question was, why have I not been arrested yet? Oh, you mean is a? Uh, oh, do these wonderful agencies which control banks and governments? Do they basically like you? The man. Does the NSA like me? I uh, I published a, a very widely reshared blog post where I told them to fuck off because they hacked the software that I wrote at Google. So I and that was my 15 minutes of fame. My parents were not very impressed that swearing is what got me into the newspapers. <laughs> so I'm guessing that the agencies don't like us very much. No. Um, but, I mean, uh, the flip side actually is that um, the blockchain is, uh, you know, every transaction is listed there and they're sort of nominally private, but in practice, Bitcoin's privacy has all kinds of giant holes in it. Uh, and um, the NSA and GCHQ, right, they're actually monitoring fiber traffic and Bitcoin traffic is unencrypted, actually. A lot of people f mistakenly believe Bitcoin is an encrypted system, but nothing in Bitcoin is encrypted. So what this means is that if I was working at the NSA or GCHQ and they gave me a team of, like, five people and they said, you know, work on this for six months, I'd probably be able to de-anonymize 70, 80, 90% of the Bitcoin system. So I would not expect uh, Bitcoin to keep you private from the NSA. And with this very realistic and very sobering uh, presentation, I must say, uh, I want to make thank, thank very much. And we're going to be, um, 